I think we're ready to go. I know we have a few others uh, that I dropped off earlier uh, who said they wanted to come here, uh, and I don't see them yet, so we'll have a few maybe later arriving, but I want to go ahead and get started uh, so we leave plenty of time for, for questions uh, for Professor Sturgeon here that, uh, that you may have at the end. So, um, so in this afternoon's session, uh, Professor Brad Sturgeon here to my right share more about the Pico uh, Brewery Startup, De Novo Beverage of Monmouth, LLC. Uh, Brad attended Illinois State and received both his ba bachelor's and his master's uh, in 80, was it 80, 87 and 89, uh, respectively, and then went on to receive his PhD from the University of California, Davis, uh, in 1994. And Brad has been with Monmouth since 2007 uh, and is currently an associate professor of chemistry uh, with an emphasis and focus on physical chemistry. Uh, his partner, uh, Dr. Steve Merman, class of 1980 uh, from Monmouth, unfortunately is unable to be here today, so you get the full Brad show uh, for, uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for, uh, for all of it. But uh, just a little bit about Dr. Merman. Um, like I mentioned, he graduated in 1980. He went on to the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where he received his DDS in 1985, and Steve has owned and operated his own clinic uh, just next door here for over 28 years. So, without further ado, Professor Sturgeon. All right, thank you. I don't use a microphone very often, so I might, uh, I'll have some introductory comments and then I'm going to drop this because I work with my hands a lot. So, but, uh, but anyway, yeah, it's uh, great to come out. Thank you all for having me. and. Uh, the opportunity to interact with all of you is always special for me. Um, yeah, it was uh, about four years ago that I went to the dentist next door over here, and uh, I was talking to Steve, and he had told me that he was a home brewer and that he had been brewing for probably 25 years, and he pretty much just made the same beer every time he made beer. And I told him that I'd been home brewing probably for 15 or so years. And uh, we kind of looked at each other at the end. And you know how the whole dentist thing works. So he's talking, he's got his fingers in my mouth. Right? And so I didn't get to really give much of a feedback in that conversation. Uh, but I think at the end of the conversation, uh, we both agreed that it would be crazy to open up a small brewery here in Monmouth, even though I think it would be well uh, received. Um, well, my next appointment that I came back, you know, after deciding that, you know, that's just too much work, He's got his dental practice. I'm teaching chemistry at the college. You know, that's too much work. Well, I came back and <coughs> these two front teeth uh, were added in. And while that process was going on, somehow Steve, since he's not here, I can blame it on him. Right? He, he convinced me that we should probably start a brewery. And so again, with his fingers in my mouth and all I could do is God. And uh, so, so I'm going to totally blame it on him for that. Uh, at least that's what I tell my wife. Uh, and I think he tells his wife that I was responsible too. So, um, but yeah, so we we got together and uh, we started over at Olivia's, which is on this back corner over here, which is no longer with us. But we had uh, set up an entire brewery upstairs until we learned out learned that uh, the laws of uh, in the state of Illinois are are kind of picky uh, about things. And again, we agree that it does say on the paper that we couldn't do what we wanted to do. So again, this is another important lesson for a, a chemistry faculty member who's teaching students and that I understand that people don't always read things and understand them very well. And so I guess I was a victim of this as well as my students are on occasion. So I can relate to their uh, inability to read between the lines and understand all the details. So, uh, but, uh, so we uh, moved the brewery actually to the basement of Steve's dentist office. So right down there is the brewery through that wall. Um, and uh, um, yeah, we, uh, we've kind of progressed. We've uh, had our license now for three years. Um, we have moved from sort of home brewing, which is sort of five gallons. We moved to a 15 gallon system. And that's when we started actually selling beer, which is a lot of work for 15 gallons of beer because it's about six hours to brew beer, whether you do five gallons or 15 gallons. And now we essentially have 75 gallon vats down in the basement. So we, can, we generally make about 50 gallons at a time now. So, so we're moving up in the world. Um, you know, we don't make money, but the important thing is we don't lose money. <laughs> so so we, uh, we kind of, uh, yeah, so, so we both have fun. And uh, 
you know, people ask me, you know, how much time you put in there. And so, you know, with my full-time job at the college and Steve's full-time dental practice, we make a really good partnership. And when I'm busy, he can cover for me. And during the summer, when he likes to take his vacations, then I have a little lighter schedule during the summer. And so it's a really wonderful partnership. And so I've learned a lot about business and it has everything to do with who your partner is in business. And Steve is an outstanding business partner. He says I'm okay. <laughs> uh, I think I think we get along pretty well. So um, <clears throat> anyway, so uh, so today actually I'm going to give you some brief introduction to maybe a little history about beer. But then uh, we have plenty of glasses here. We have our product over here to sample, and um, I'll talk a little bit about the brewing process. But uh, before we uh, start uh, sort of thinking about the beer itself. Uh, I'll ask you to sort of think about maybe 100,000 years ago as a human on this earth, all right? 100,000 years ago, there was a lot of things going on. Uh, there were some ice ages in place. And so as, the, um, as we learn about people back that time, they were essentially nomadic and they moved around. And actually they hunted and they gathered. And actually this whole idea that the college has been talking about with food security really stands out because when you're a nomadic person in Africa, your main goal every day was to make sure you had food, right? And so food security is a big thing that carries on with us today. These people, as they moved around, eventually there was a group of them that found themselves in what we call now the Fertile Crescent, which is sort of southern Turkey, uh, northern Iraq, Syria, northern Iran. And that particular area, and if you look at the geology of it, you know, the ice age, came, the, the ice came down and then backed off. And so you made this really nice area where there was plenty of water, and it turned out that there was a lot of grain there. And so if you're a nomadic individual, and you're walking along, and you're hunting, and all of a sudden you come into a massive field of grain, you say to yourself, well, do I really have to keep walking? <laughs> right? Because in reality, if there's all that grain there and all that grass, right, grass and the seeds, well, there's a lot of other animals coming in. So it actually became very easy to hunt, and it was very easy to gather food. And so people said, hey, well, let's hang out here for a little bit, right? And um, actually, in the... Uh, can you hear me if I just talk like this? Yeah, yeah. All right. I'm going to set this down. Oh. oh, thank you. Um, Actually, one of my classes that I just finished teaching, this is a great book if you want to read about the history of the world in six glasses. Uh, the two introductory chapters are on beer. And so the story that I tell you here is on, on beer. The second two are on wine. And then it goes into spirits. And then it goes coffee, tea, and soft drinks. Right? So this is a really very easy book. Um, I did not assign any reading from this, so we probably don't need to discuss that any further. But what I will do is uh, I have some uh, handouts here. Yeah, if you guys, uh, I'm going to keep one. And uh, actually, I think there's uh, about 20 or so in there, so maybe if you guys shared them between each other. But so again, picture yourself this. Uh, I, let me set the time course because 100,000 years ago, people were roaming. It was about 10,000 years ago that people started to settle down and become non-nomadic and set up tribes and, and civilization and things like that. As you settled down, though, you ended up having all of this grain, and so you had surplus food. And actually, we exist in a society where we have surplus food right now because, again, I don't know about how many of you went out and foraged for food this morning. I did pick red raspberries off my plants in my backyard, but that's probably not what was the majority of my calories for today, right? So, um, but as you have, have this surplus of food, you have to do something with it, right? So I think we all know that if you make a soup or something, that would be something good, but there's a cycle to this too, right? So there's grain and then there's no grain, right? And so you have to have a way of storing that. So one way you can make bread, and actually, in this hieroglyph here, this is the Egyptian hieroglyph from 2700 BCE, before the Common Era, era or before Christ, same, same label. Um, you can see here that they're uh, winnowing the, the, uh, 
the grass and taking the seeds off and on the very top on the right hand side they're breaking the seeds with those big uh, posts somebody <laughs> looks like they're in the middle row there rolling some dough and as you continue it looks like on the middle on the right he's scratching his head going what am I going to do with this <laughs> uh, I wish I could read hieroglyphics because I haven't read what it says in the background but I, it's a project I'll work on at some point in time. Remember, I'm a chemist. Okay. Uh, there's only so much I can do. We're the brewery, right? Uh, but here's the important point of this. Again, storing grains, you can make bread, but even you know bread goes bad. And so bread only stores for a certain period of time. But look at closely at the last row here, and you see what they're doing in this hieroglyphic. Right? They're actually pouring a liquid into clay jars and sealing it off and then at the very bottom far right they're storing those clay jars off to the side now actually that storage lasts for a very very long time when you seal it up like that what they didn't understand was all the chemistry and other biology and stuff going on here about when you heat it you kill a lot of the microorganisms and I think Ken mentioned today that if you drank beer you were healthy if you drank water. Eh, <laughs> never know, you know, where that came from, right? And so beer actually was a very important part because that little bit of alcohol in there was enough to kill those microorganisms. And so you generally were more healthy. Although really I like to think about it from a perspective as you were less sick. <laughs> right? Because everybody was sick back then. I mean, heck, you're roaming around digging in the dirt for your food. Maybe something more of us should do on a regular basis, because actually I'm a big fan of the microbiome and uh, gut health and things like that that uh, are, are becoming a cutting edge in biochemistry and some of the areas of research stuff that I'm working on. So, but, it, but anyway, this, this I think indicates to you the importance of this whole idea of having surplus food and knowing what to do with it, right? Because you could have and pick all the food you want, but if I can't eat 10 pounds of red raspberries, they're gonna go bad, right? So you really have to think about storage in conjunction with the uh, sort of acquiring of food sources. So, um, <coughs> so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit, if you guys can hand these guys out now. Thank you. Um, uh, no, you can keep those. Yeah, I, I print it off. Uh, actually, I think there's like 25 in there, so maybe uh, half, uh, maybe share between the two or so. Um, so on the colored side here is kind of a way that I like to kind of get into talking about beer, in that um, beer is essentially made of four different things. And again, we've already talked about grain. Um, you understand clearly there's some water involved, right? There's a lot of chemistry that goes into that, of course. But then uh, most of you probably have heard the term of hops. And then the yeast carries out the biochemical processes in order to carry out the fermentation. So um, one of the things people ask me a lot of times about uh, beer is sort of, you know, how do you, you know, you have this great variety of beers turns out that there's 81 different styles of beer. Oftentimes people, they'll say to me, well, I don't like beer. I'm like, really? Like, I don't, yeah, I mean, you've tried all 81 of them? I don't know, because they're all extremely different. <clears throat> um, so, but usually I don't push beer on people, right? So, um, but, but literally what makes beer so interesting is that between these four different ingredients, you can generally generate 81 plus a whole slew of other weird things that you can get. So, um, but now, uh, actually, so what I want to do is I want to pour a beer right now, and I'm not sure how we're going to mechanically do this, but people need a glass, and uh, this particular beer right here might be about as close as what you would get if you had one of those clay pots and you popped it open. Now, some of you may be getting a little bit nervous. Um, I'm a little bit nervous to pop the top on it because you never know 
what kind of carbonation has built up over time. But I popped one over there <coughs> just a minute ago. So. Yeah. Um. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I need to pop this one. <laughs> Good oh, good. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Oh, I should have brought my this little is an beer. Um, so, uh, this particular beer is made from wheat. Okay. okay. So, wheat and barley are sort of the natural thing. But the grains that grew back in the Fertile Crescent were kind of weird. You know, if you've ever seen corn when it first started off, it kind of looked more like barley and less like a corn cob. Right? And actually, at the six acres at the Educational Garden there, they are growing some of these sort of heirloom-style corn. Uh, so, but this will probably have a, uh, it's not overly from, not overly bubbling. Hey, how about that? Would you like to sample that? <laughs> so, um, and I probably should have uh, poured uh, a little less for you. But you'll either like that or you won't like it. Um, so actually, is there some way we could uh, pour some samples for those who want them? So this one we'll call, and actually you probably, probably do something like that. Okay, how much, how much do you want? Uh, who, who wants the sample? There we go. So this one has very few hops in it because actually hops were not added until much later in the brewing process. So, but, and I'll talk about this one in just a minute. So, so it's German vice beer, is it made out of wheat? Yes, it is. Yeah, very good. Yeah, the Hefeweizen. Actually, the smell on this one is actually more of a uh, yeast character than anything else. But it tastes a little sour. Very good. It tastes like a dry white wine. Dry white wine. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, this is one of the reasons that uh, I don't actually sell this beer. Who else needs one? Um, but it's not, remember, I didn't throw it away, though, because actually I think it's pretty good. Uh, you like it on there? No, that's, a, that's, the, that's the IPA. That's, the IPA. that's a great food. Uh -huh. How many more beers do we need? You want to get rid of it, the rest of it all. <laughs> okay, well, and they'll be up here for later. I got another five. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. So, so let me tell you about this one. So, this is a wheat beer. Um, the federal government has restrictions that I have to have 50% of the weight is barley in any beer that I make. You guys probably have heard of Zima. Right? They, yeah. I don't know if it's around anymore, but that they call a malted beverage. They don't call it a beer. It doesn't look like a beer, right? But they're, they're not really brewers. They're using other fermentable sugars, right? But any beer has to have at least 50% barley. And so this is 50% barley, 50% wheat. Um, these, see, we can, uh, there's, there's two, of, two more of those, says two row and wheat. Are those yep. ones in front? Yeah, you can just start those from every other row. Okay. Um, this is uh, the barley or the grains that we use. So I would suggest you take one and eat it. Um, they're uh, they're uh, perfectly fine. I wouldn't say it's the, like the best edible thing, but remember, <laughs> we're talking about, uh, you know, now 10,000 years ago, you just <coughs> cracked open one of your clay jars of beer, and, you know, you're enjoying that, and you might just gnaw on a few grains of seed, right, to supplement that. Um, but remember the, uh, the uh, actually, and so there's two trays going around. One says two row, that's barley, and the other one says wheat. 
And actually, it turns out barley has a husk on it. How many farmers we got in here? Okay. So, so yeah, barley has a husk, and the wheat does not have a husk. But there's a little bit of a husk, but it's not a very much of a husk. Um, so they're very different in the way that they're processed. Um, and the, they're very different in the way they taste, except for these two grains are mainly starch. Um, now, again, I could, I could go on for hours. I kind of hit these walls. I'm like, oh, I totally want to go there. But I probably can't. But, um, but keep in mind that if you're a plant and you're going to make an offspring through a seed, you want to make sure that that seed has plenty of food. Again, we're back to this idea of food security, right? So what's it do is it puts all this extra food in the seed, and so when it hits the ground, it starts to germinate. It kicks on all these activities that start breaking down the starches into sugars. The plant uses the sugars while it's looking for nutrients in the soil and waiting for the rain to come, right? And so. But even plants are thinking about food security in that way. Um, I take advantage of that as a brewer and that these grains that I just sent around are all malted, which means I tricked it into thinking that it was going to grow. And so it produced all these enzymes in here. It started to break down the starches and make sugars. And then I threw it in a kiln <laughs> and, and heated it up. So, it, yeah, I essentially kill the plants, but what I'm doing is I'm taking advantage of the enzymes. Now, I didn't do that. There are people it's in the bigger. brewing process that are called maltsters. So if you're a maltster, you learn how to malt beer, or malt grain. So let's pass these two around now. Actually, you can take two more there. So uh, they, these two here, again, you can process, the maltster can process grain in many ways, and You'll see that there's a chocolate, and it sort of tastes a little bit like an ashtray. Um, <laughs> I said that right as you started. To <laughs> but if you think chocolate, as you're, right? Think chocolate, think chocolate. Okay, yeah, there's chocolate there. Right? Um, uh, but when you put it into a beer, actually the darker grains are going to give you the stouts or the porters, right? And so these lighter things like wheat beers that you just had is very uh, clear, right? There's very little color to it. So, so again, if we have like grain-focused beers, then that's sort of how I come at it. And again, our name is De Novo, which means it's Latin for from the beginning. So every time I brew a beer, I think about it in this way, like do I want to have a grain focused beer or do I want to do something else to that? I want to have a yeast focused, I want to have a hop focused, right? And so I think about these things from very basic principles. I typically also don't use anything other than natural things like hop plants or grain. Um, <clears throat> I have played around a little bit with some extracts. Actually, Cherry Street over in Galesburg is going to start carrying our beer. And they said, can you make a cherry beer? And I said, well, I could. Uh, so again, that's the business guy speaking. Yes, I'd love to make you a cherry beer. <laughs> the science guy's going, yeah, I don't have enough cherries. We don't grow cherries here. We're not in Michigan. Uh, and I can't grow a tree that fast, but they make some pretty good extracts yeah, that you can add cherry flavor to. Right. So. We just yes. tried this. Do, when they ask you to do a special beer like that, do they ever ask you if you can make a good one, or are they just ask you if you can make it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, generally, yeah, that's sort of a uh, accepted. Um, but, but Steve, that's a much more important question than you know because. You know, when I teach chemistry and I ask them to calculate the molarity of a particular solution, there's one answer. If you don't get that answer, you're wrong. So there is a good answer. Right? When I pour you a beer, some of you will like one, some of you will like another, some will like another one, some will hate one, right? And so there is no good beer, just like there is no good coffee. I say the best coffee and the best beer are the ones that you choose for yourself. All right, this is an interesting educational thing, right? Because a lot of times students are in the mode of thinking, oh, 
there's a right answer and I need to get to it and then when I get there, the faculty member will give me an A, right? And so actually I try to set up things actually where there isn't an end goal. It is more about the process of the education than it is the end goal. So, so yeah, I don't know if it's good. It's good if you drink it. So, um, Brad. Yes. Um, how did I manage as a barley farmer to get a long Fifty percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know the history behind that, other than um, there was this social experiment called prohibition uh, that uh, that led to a lot of different ways to control how alcohol is distributed. Um, hold that thought in yours for one yeah, second. Hold on one second. Hey, you know what? That Piper Ale and the Red Ale, you can just start pouring those in people's glasses. Okay. Yeah. So the Piper and the Red. Yeah, because these two beers are, are very grain focused, right? And so I'll let you guys pour these around as I continue to address your question. So, but actually, so in Germany, there's this thing called Reinheitsgebot. And Reinheitsgebot was a law in 1594 or something like that. And it pretty much said that if your beer you have barley, you have water, and you have hops. Now, we didn't know about yeast until the mid-1800s, so they didn't add that into the law. But I, I don't know why they did it. There's a lot of conversation about why they did that and took control of that. Well, the answer that I like the best is that the Belgians were brewing really weird beers <laughs> and so if they had something else in their beer, they couldn't bring it into Germany and sell it as a beer, so they could tax it differently. Uh, so, so I think it has a lot to do with taxes, uh, is, my, is the short answer. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, two questions. The uh, uh, AB, uh, InBev process called Beachwood Aging, yep. and then pasteurization. Talk about those two processes. Yeah, so, so actually, when I was a younger individual, I went to the, to the uh, Anheuser-Busch Brewery, and I found or I saw a piece of beech wood sitting over on the floor, and I'm like, oh, finally, right? Like, and so I picked it up, and I kind of, when no one was looking, started kind of gnawing it like maybe it had some sort of magic in it. Um, no. Uh, actually, beech wood, and again, I'm not a biologist, but supposedly beech wood has a very open cellular structure. So when you put the beech wood in a lagering tank, you're essentially adding surface area for, for the yeast to do their job. So in a Budweiser, it's a very, very clean beer. There's no flavor. <laughs> Right? I mean, it, it really, there's nothing spectacular about it as far as the flavor is concerned. With these beers that you're sampling now, this Piper Ale, which is, again, a very grain, very malty uh, beer, and then the Red Ale has sort of that malty backbone, but it also has some roasted grains in there to kind of give it a little nutty character. Um, so, but yeah, Beechwood is just added in order to increase the surface area so that the yeast can fully metabolize everything in that beer and turn it into alcohol. Um, now the second well, question. Pasteurization. Yeah, so pasteurization. So these beers that we have here are essentially a live culture. They are, there's yeast in the bottom, but they're so fresh the yeast doesn't have time to settle out. But we don't filter our beers, we don't pasteurize our beers, and so it's literally a live culture. If you're going to take a beer and put it on a shelf, or better yet, put it in a case, put it in a warehouse, go through a distributorship, and then put it in the grocery store, and then you're going to buy it, it's going to have to sort of be a little bit more purified. And so the pasteurization process kills the, the yeast and anything else that's in there, and sort of stops it in time. That's why there's a, there's a board on days, because it just goes downhill from there. Now my <coughs> beers actually will evolve in time, and I don't know what Steve thinks about it. He might like it, or he might not like it after it sits for a while. Um, I do know that our darker beers get better with age. 
so we oftentimes will keep them in the brewery for about two to three months before we release them. But they get better even after six to eight months. Um, so, so yeah, so pasteurization is a way to purify, but, but as a small brewer <coughs> with small quantities, I can bring it over to Market Alley Wine or I can bring it back to Annie's, and so I don't pasteurize anything. If, there's, if it's not gone in two to three weeks, which it usually is, then I need to be concerned about it, but I haven't reached that point yet. So your alcohol <coughs> continues to go up as... as uh, no, because that's more related to the sugar content. So the sugar gets, uh, we call it, uh, when it gets fully attenuated, when the sugar's gone, and we can make those measurements in the brewery. And so once it's fully attenuated, then we'll move it into the carbonation process. But the bacteria, or the, sorry, the yeast is still in there, and it will even, some of the flavor components, it will modify those throughout the, the time in the bottle. So, Very good. Thank yeah, you. sir. Two part question. Uh, Illinois is a big grower of wheat. Uh huh. So we don't grow much barley or hops. Yeah. And the reason why that hasn't you know, been worked into the agricultural system, and also each state grows their wheat. Which is the better <coughs> variety of wheat to use? Well, so when I buy grains, I can choose things like a winter wheat, a red wheat, a white wheat, um, and I don't know what that does to my beer. I pretty much have a recipe that I know that uses a red wheat, and I buy that red wheat all the time. Now again, as a chemist, that kind of kills me because I'd like to do experiments, and so I'm in the middle of that experiment. Uh, uh, well, most of my brewery activities are very separate from the college. <laughs> and it's, yeah, yeah I, I think it's probably best. And Again, I do have a platform that I will speak to students about and that if you're going to make a choice going to the store and buying a 30-pack of Stroh's or maybe a six-pack of Dragon's Milk, you know, from New Holland, uh, I mean, Think about what you're doing, and, and it's not about the 30 pack, it's not about the alcohol, it's about the flavor in that beer, and that's what you call a mature individual, and they usually look at me and go, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Run and put two 30 packs out of there, but eventually I will maybe get to them at some point. And actually, the more senior students will get into the chemistry like I did, and sort of be able to sort of appreciate those details. So. Uh, but yeah, so I don't understand the agricultural part. That's that's a part of the business I haven't gotten into yet. But. Has there been exposure to the dormitory brewery? I'm not sure I can speak to that. I feel like James Comey here. Well, no, I guess I don't see any of my deans here per se. But uh, yeah, there are some who who will. Brew. Again, but if you just take grain and you mix this stuff together, you're cooking. The fact that you accidentally left it sit somewhere with some yeast that fell in there, I mean, that's just a <laughs> <laughs> do, do you mulch your own grains? Um, actually, I have a friend who has a hobby farm, and so, oh, sorry, you say malt? Yes. Oh, no. No, the maltster is a you know, they do this in a very uh, controlled environment. And again, as a chemist who teaches thermodynamics, I like the idea of thinking about temperature and heat and control. But <clears throat> you pretty much have to do it inside on a big concrete floor. And you have to rotate it every two hours. Mm -hmm. So they have these things that look kind of like snow blowers. Yeah. They kind of go in and kind of <laughs> turn it. Yeah. So it's, it's really quite involved. Where is uh, this? Um, actually, there's three main maltsters. Uh, um, it's actually becoming a craft thing, too, and that craft beer, if you do craft malting, but you know, there's only so much you can do with the whole thing. But um, there's Canadian ones. There's, they're up in Minnesota. Uh, there's ones, uh, actually, I don't really exactly one, one know. One just started up in Cleveland about two years ago. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and there are there are systems that you can buy for your brewery that will do your own malting, which adds a whole other level to the craft nature of it. So, but uh, did you have a question? 
Yeah, uh, Miller is Miller uh, MTD is, is cold filtered. <laughs> yeah. What's cold? What's is that normal or what? Are they all cold filtered? What's cold filtered mean? Yeah, it, they're all cold filtered and they're all triple hopped. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're just the ones who marketed it that way. Well, the reason yeah. I ask is my wife has a reaction to something that if it, if it has not been cold filtered. So she'll only drink Coors or MGD because they're mm. cold, quote cold filtered. We went to Golden, to the uh -huh. Coors plant, and they, they stressed that there. Well, and cooling it down might make some of the proteins fall out. And so yeah, potentially, I mean, gluten is a protein. Yeah. So it's possible that if you filter it while it's cold, but I think everybody filters it cold, but when you filter it, you can filter it at a different level, right? I mean, whatever the mesh size is in your filter, so you can take more or less out of there. Um, if you're a logger, you want it to be super crystal clear, and so you're probably using a very fine mesh to do the filtering. I'd have to think a little bit about cores or MDD to see their process, but... Um, yeah, there, it is a complex mixture, right? So there are certain things that that you may react to differently. Yeah. Yes. What long-term goals do you have for yourself? Well, the one that I mentioned about not losing money. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I do not have a, a more is better mentality because um, a bigger brewery, even though as I sort of mentioned but didn't follow through necessary with but if I brew five gallons of beer it takes me six hours if I do 15 it takes me six hours if I do 50 it still takes me six hours but actually it only takes me five hours now because my system's a little bit more I, I know how to work things a little better nowadays so uh, if I got a 10 barrel system which is like 300 gallons that would be good but Every keg of beer I sell, I drag up the stairs over there. Oh. <laughs> uh, and I put it in the back of my truck. And so, again, I'm in a place where we're pretty content. Um, I don't like the bottle because uh, I bottle each one of those one at a time. And I don't mind doing it because uh, Market Alley was one of our first customers when we were doing very small scale. So, again, as a business person, I have a connection with Susan over there and the new owner. Um, so I don't dislike doing it, it's just part of the business. So, so I'm pretty content where I am, which is a really bad business answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm a scientist. You treat it as a hobby. It is, yeah. Yeah, it is kind of how we treat it as a hobby. But it's a hobby where I can bring people over and I can come do this. And, you know, I don't run out of beer. <laughs> Although I don't really drink my beer very often because I'm always sampling. Steve? I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan, I think you know that, of your Denovo Stout. That's, a, that's an excellent quality beer. Um, what's your, di so this is a follow on the last question. So how broad is your distribution center chain? Where, where, are your, where are your outlets right now? Yeah, right now we go back to Danny's, which is across there over Market Alley. We throw a keg at Bijou every once in a while. We're out at Petey's. Um, uh, there's some special events like Bacon Fest will do. Um, we used to be at Fat Fish over in Galesburg, but they had an ownership change. Uh, and then Cherry Street is coming online here shortly. Um, uh, actually, the new uh, Bistro 112. Which was Olivia's. Yeah, right. yeah, he's got, he's going to have our beer there. Uh, so, yeah, so we have plenty of outlets. And again, if I can work 10 hours a week or so, then that works well. Hey, before I answer another question, what kind of timing am I doing here? We're about quarter till, so okay, probably so another really maybe behind. So it's a little behind. But just grab bottles and throw it at them. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, let me do just one more thing, and I'll be certainly happy to wait around and answer any questions. But um, these, actually, why don't you just pass those around? See, now I'm working one-handed here. Yeah. Um, these are the hops. So again, remember I talked about we have sort of grain-centered beers, and then we have a hop-centered beer. And again, you can take a hop, I'll we'll vacuum afterwards, it's a little messy sometimes, but uh, you'll see these are like little dried flowers. And if you, uh, um, no, well you could if you wanted, I mean they're food grade. Um, I grew these in Monmouth in 2013, but if you smell them, 
you might get sort of a citrusy aroma. I mean, it still has sort of an earthy aroma or green aroma to it, which will actually get boiled off when we brew the beer. Um, but they, they become even more aromatic if you kind of smash them between your fingers because there's this little thing called a lupulin gland. And so the lupulin gland are little tiny spheres of goodness, we like to think of it. And they're like little wax balls that are right at the strig of the hop plant. And if you break those open, you get the essential oils and all that other wonderful stuff. So actually, we have a, a new beer. We call it this uh, hop series where we brew the beer with only a single variety of hops. So this one here that we could pour next in the orange, yeah, that's a, a citra. Yeah, that, the, you can smell the grapefruit in it. Yeah, yeah, you can get grapefruit. And again, each one of you experiences it very differently. I'm kind of nasally challenged, uh, but, uh, but I'm a big fan of, uh, of a hoppy beer. So um, the question that somebody had about the idea of triple hops. So when you add the hops really early uh, in the process of making beer, and you boil them for like an hour, you create a bitterness that is in the beer. The beers that you've drank already don't have much of a bitterness to them, a little bit. Some of you are more sensitive than others. Uh, but this one is starting to have some hops in there that will give some bitterness, and it'll kind of come across as a dryness on the finish. Um, but the middle edition adds flavor. And when you add them late in the process, or in what we call dry hopping, which is even after fermentation, you get aroma. So, so you should totally smell somebody's glass if, you have, if, it, if you're not drinking it, but it literally smells like a, a lemon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it doesn't, it sort of tastes like a lemon, but not really. But the bitterness there hopefully kind of brings you back and going, yes, I'm drinking a beer now. But it tastes like lemon, so one right. second. Yeah, so, so pardon my ignorance on this, but so is the hop off of, is it a vine or is it a ground cover? What, how, where's the hop coming from? Yeah, it's a, it's, I'll say right now, it's a vine, yeah. but in technical terms, it's really a vine with a B, not a V, okay. because uh, the way that it doesn't grow with tendrils. If you send out tendrils like a string bean uh, vining bean plant, it kind of reaches up and then keeps going. But a hop vine just doesn't have that, but it has little hairs on it that when it kind of gets stuck on something, it can continue to grow. So, but yeah, it's a flower, essentially. Did you have a question about this? Yes, I was wondering, a lot of the West Coast uh, microbreweries are oh, putting out yeah. a, a, a bitterness coat on it. An IBU? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, and, um, yes and no. Um, in the chemistry lab, I can measure IBUs, but the measurement is kind of like, uh, it's not very, uh, it's not really very descriptive. Because a darker beer will have a high IBU, but it doesn't, you don't perceive it that way. So, so, yeah, so a lot of times, well, they talk about perceived bitterness. I think it's a better thing, but that's different because it's a tasting parameter opposed to a number. But if you like hoppy beers, look for a high IBU, right? Um, and we couldn't make those measurements, so. What else do we have over there? Actually, so let's do the bagpipe stout, and then I can answer some more questions. But the bagpipe stout just uses a darker grain. Now, turns out darker grains, when you malt them darker, the starches tend to kind of break down and you make non-fermentable sugars. And so this is why a stout a lot of times will have a little bit more of a, a body to it. And it may be not sweet because the sweetness is small sugars. The small sugars have been fermented away these are sort of like bigger sugars that kind of add to the body of the beer. So, and in case I lose some of you guys, because I've only got one more to sample, but this beer here, we call it Bagpipe Stout. There's another one over here called Dryden Stout, named after my friend's farm, Paul Rickey. 
He's a dried guy. That's his, his mother's maiden name. So, um, but that one has the Scotch Roast coffee in it. So it's exactly the same beer, but it's added some coffee to it. And you'll tell a real difference between there. So, so you can start pouring the dried after, uh, uh, and, and you'll see how there is a sort of a subtle, maybe not such a subtle difference, but and, and that difference is purely the coffee that's been added in there. It's not enough to give you any sort of caffeine, but it definitely has flavor. So, all right. Um, actually, let's just go free for all here then, huh? <laughs> what what um, the Citra? I find that to be an incredibly interesting. Yeah. Uh, is it a new variety? Because I've never heard of it before. Does it come out of the Northwest, like Oregon or, or uh, Washington yeah. State? Yeah. The Northwest is where they do most hop research, yeah. and so they're doing crosses between the different breeds yeah. of hops. Um, it's relatively new. Um, I do. I don't know if I could buy a hop rhizome because I think the trademark is still out. But I can buy hop flowers. Um, but yeah, the other one that we have that's coming out is is a hop that's similar to it, but it's called a Zika, and and so it should be very different. And unfortunately, I don't have that one ready to serve. It'll be out in another couple weeks. The, the central so. very very unique. Yeah, yeah. Well, and there's. There are some smaller breweries around. I mean, it's super fresh, yeah. right? It, it's it's alive. It, this is what you get from a very small brewery. So the question is, should I get bigger? No. Well, then I'll just kind of go downhill. I think in some of that the taste profile. So, but yes, sir. Question. I saw. I think I saw. Did you going to ask some about Paul Ricky? Well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, yes. Uh, people uh, so I think they had a plot of you know uh, there are some Oh, in the educational yeah, garden, the garden close right. to campus? Yeah, there's a couple of hops. They're trying to grow yeah, they're trying to have no, I had some extra rhizomes and I okay. just threw them along that <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, this beautiful park over here, uh, if you haven't gotten out there to see that, um, I threw some in there too. <laughs> uh, I mean, Christine said I could. Unfortunately, they weed whacked them. <laughs> so, but they'll come back. So, uh, anyway, hey Michael, again, I don't want to take any more time, but I'm gonna just keep answering. You start uh, pulling it on the back of my shirt. Okay. Whatever. So. We're 153, so we re really don't have anything right at two o'clock. There are the Greek open houses from 1:30 to three, so you have time to shuttle. Uh, should be, if there's not one, one, uh, one just left, so another one will be coming. So if you're ready to leave, then, you know, and you've had a, your fill, uh, then you're welcome to go. And again, the shuttle will be right out here. Um, but uh, if you need to know what's next on the schedule, let us know, and we can kind of announce that as well. So yeah, if, if everyone's content, keep answering questions. Okay, so I'll keep going here, but again, if your glass is low, yes? Uh, this one that I brought over here, that six glasses. Yeah, I didn't write it. I wish it was mine. But, uh, you can get it. Uh, take your cell phone, snap a picture of it. It's like nine dollars on Amazon. Yeah, yeah, it's a great book. You didn't write it. No, I wish I did. But yeah, you know, I own a brewery and I teach too. So when are you going to get around to that, Brad? I haven't gotten around. Well, actually, I am working on something. Um, Hey, and if your glass is empty, it really, you're falling behind. <laughs> so, so uh, again, there's some more of that, that wheat beer that I first gave you is in the category of a sour ale. So that sourness, though, you know, if you understand that uh, vinegar, like red wine vinegar, is used to be really good wine and it went bad, right? If you're paying... $40 for a bottle of red wine vinegar, you're doing it right, because it used to be a $30 bottle of wine. <laughs> All right? So another level of processing. So and that's, a, that's a bacteria, and not all bacteria are bad. Actually, the majority of them are totally excellent for you. Right? But uh, lactobacillus is the one that makes lactic acid. So if you like this lactic acid in that first wheat beer, then you like sour beers. Um, and so the reason I don't sell this one is that I didn't do it intentionally. 
<laughs> so, but please, uh, if, if you need more something, I don't know what they're going to do with all that extra beer there. So. Uh, We're staying here. Okay, excellent. All right. Burn up a little secret before I read it. Any other questions? Yeah. I like the green label one. Okay, you have a, 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 a guess as far as what some of the earliest beers might have what, what way they might have been in, in terms of taste or sourness or yeah and yeah so so the sourness essentially comes from there's lactic acid bacteria thank you cheers um, everywhere right and and so it's everywhere so unless you do a really really good job to keep it out you're going to get it in there so all beers I just want to be back in time uh, that are more than 20 years old were well maybe let's go 60 years old were sour. Um, and so it's a very sour mash. A lot of times what they did is they put fruit in with it in order to sort of compensate for that. But when you throw fruit in, you're adding more sugars. And so it starts frothing up again because of the yeast in there. And they didn't quite understand the yeast role. Um, you, might have under, you might have heard this term croisoning. Yes. Right, so croisoning means just scooping some of the crap off the top of one beer, <laughs> throwing it in another one. <laughs> and so it sounds fancy, right? But really, it just means transferring the yeast. But they didn't know that they were transferring the yeast. And they would use the same clay pot because even if you wash the clay pot, I mean, and again, back in the day, you didn't necessarily have these antibacterial soaps, and so you still had yeast and stuff in your clay pot. Yeah, well, and you mentioned the word Bach. Yeah. Bach does something called a decoction where they actually boil the grains and you get some of the more darker astringency kind of things in there. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, way, way back, the beer was not very good. Um, so this is, this as well, again, the nomad that we came from wasn't, you know, wearing a fine Hawaiian print shirt either. <laughs> so, so we all evolved, and I think beer has evolved in a way too, so. Yes, Brad, I understand, you know, what you're doing is, is pretty much in the category of, uh, as a hobby right now. But thinking a little, in a little bigger sphere, you're part of the microbrewery industry. Well, I am and a professional, you're, people remind you know, me, because I pay a lot of money. is for... impacting <laughs> the big brewers. I mean, because they're buying yeah. them up, uh, buying, uh, you know, smaller microbreweries up because you're taking market share away from them. How yep. do you think about this in terms of your part in it? Well, and actually, there's, uh, there's if, if you're looking for some reading, just go onto Wikipedia and read about something called the three-tier distribution system. And the three-tier distribution system came from after prohibition was relaxed. That they said that the manufacturer is not allowed to interact with the customer. Thank you, Doc. So you have to have a distributor, and then the distributor talks with the retailer. So there's a manufacturer. I can't give the retailer a bargain so that they buy my beer in sort of a, what we call the term a tied house. So if you have a bar that is tied with a brewery. Anybody from Kiwani? I see Kiwani has a, 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 a bar that was essentially owned by Pabst Blue Ribbon. And even the bars have the inlays of Pabst Blue Ribbon in there. I forget the name of it right now, but it was a tied house. But it was, essentially they had sold their soul to Pabst Blue Ribbon, right? And so you only sold Pabst Blue Ribbon there. Um, so this three-tier distribution system prevented those sorts of things, because Al Capone could convince you to buy his beer, right? And so they took, they put a middleman in there to prevent that. Now the state of Illinois and most states now allow me to not only pay $1,500 for my license to manufacture, but they charge me $25 to self-distribute. So meaning, yes, I pay twenty-five dollars to drag it up the stairs myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so the laws are light or le loosening up a bit, um, and I don't know what what the big guys are going to be doing, but they're certainly going to be buying up the smaller guys, trying to make them more efficient. 
and I don't have a problem with that. I mean, if somebody wants to come by my brewery, I'll probably say, really? <laughs> but, but, I mean, the, the other case is somebody could come into Monmouth with a much larger system, and at that point I might just close down and go help them. Uh, I am working on a brewery in Quincy. <laughs> Yeah, Tom. When you drink, when you're out, and they don't carry your beer at the bar, what, what beer do you like to buy? Well, and generally, I will look for other beers. Um, I am kind of a hop head. Um, the problem is, is some of these really hoppy beers like Citra, now a lot of the brewers, because it's more consistent, they're using hop oils. So the really over-the-top beers, I mean, it comes from the oil with their CO2 extraction methods to get that out. Um, so I will, if I'm at Applebee's, and I'll order a Boston Lager, Sam Adams Boston Lager. Uh, it's sort of a go-to beer. It's got a nice little uh, uh, hop finish. That's a Saws hop, which is a different variety, but it kind of is more of a Czech type hop. Um, I like New Belgian beers, uh, and anything that's local. Uh, or small in a town that I go to, uh, like Toppling Goliath up in Decorah. My son just uh, signed on for four years at Luther College, and uh, so I get to go visit that place too. So, yeah. Did you like that, uh, that stuff I brought you from Cleveland? Yes. Well, the Great Lakes. Great Lakes. Great Lakes. Great Lakes. Yeah, Great Lakes is good stuff. Yeah, and the Burning something or other is their IPA. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I do buy that on occasion. I sort of, once I know it though, I usually try something different. Keep working. Yeah, so, yes. I know you officially keep this separate from your career at college. Are the colleges into food science and, you know, into that era of academics and so on? How do you somewhat integrate this to, with your academics and your students? I mean, to me, it's a great thing because I would think students can grasp it. Um, that, that, that yeah. Some in. Well, and I when I started, Maury Ditzler was president. Okay, and uh, Maury had said on a number of occasions that we must expose students to complex topics or complex situations. So actually, the brewing process itself, if you could understand from what we call a grain to glass, and even the chemistry behind carbonation, right? That whole process, what you might call process engineering, is a very important and somewhat complex thing. And so I will talk about it in general chemistry. Um, um, you know, the fact that these aroma compounds are actually not water soluble is why they're not in there. <laughs> they're coming out and you smell them. Yeah. Or if they're water soluble, they'd be in there, right? And that's the difference between way things partition. Um, so yeah, I mean, I integrate it in, in many ways. And um, I have a student this summer who wants to come over and brew a, um, a ginger ale. Um, so it's non-alcoholic, but ginger is an interesting product. And actually right now, if you look around, craft soft drinks are the next big thing. But uh, um, actually soft drinks are really I mean, my best soft drink, and I was going to bring some, uh, set it up with a keg, but it, we had enough to consume and talk about here. But, uh, but I call it my baby aspirin orange soda. <laughs> it's like those old baby aspirin, the chewable ones. Yeah. But it's essentially tang with a little bit of vanilla in there and water, and you carbonate it, and you're like, you, you're like, wow, this is really amazing. And like, it's tang. <laughs> yeah. I can, shock people. Now these beers I worked hard for, so these I'm proud of. But my tank, my baby aspirin, orange is, you know, so, but, yeah. other questions? Interject here now that we're yes, a interject, after two okay. So, um, like I said, Brad is w certainly willing to stick around a little bit afterward if you'd like to sample something else. Uh, as I mentioned, from 1.30 to 3, the Greek open houses are, are going on. We'll be shuttling, if you would rather not walk, we'll be shuttling uh, around uh, with the, the vans to each of those locations. Uh, and then at 3 o'clock is the Q&A with our senior staff in the Morgan Room and Polling Hall. Uh, so, and then um, at 4.15, stories from a revolution, 50 years in farming. 
Oh, you just took off? Okay. Get, get ready for it. Okay. So, uh, oh, you were speaking to it? Okay. Great. Great. So, uh, that's what's uh, up before the progressive dinner this evening. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, Brad. All right. Thank you.